Um, thank you all so much for coming, especially in these weird times. I'm really excited to be here. Um, for those who don't know, uh, this is part of the Center for Creativity, which was created by Jean Marie Laskus and Kit Ayers that really recognize that creativity doesn't just stop in one department or another, but it's throughout the university. And for that matter, it's throughout Pittsburgh and, and we have amazing stories to tell. And tonight we're gonna tell some success stories of how those stories ended up as movies. And then we're gonna try to find help for you guys who have your own movies and TV shows you wanna do. So we have a great panel of people who are from Pittsburgh and from Hollywood. And we're gonna go through the three movies that were talked about, which is Concussion with Will Smith, Pride starring Terrence Howard and uh, Dear Zoe, which is a movie that just got filmed here that's starring Sadie Sink, which will be out next year. So um, before we do that, I'll briefly tell you a little bit about, uh, if you don't know, I uh, grew up out here, had a horrible childhood, but that was I wrote a short story in college that was about a waitress I met at the St. Elmo Hotel. This will be the only special effect for the evening. You see the St. Elmo Hotel sign, that's where I was a bellhop. I had no idea you could make movies, and I ended up writing that short story. It took me out to Hollywood, and I learned the industry, and I became a screenwriter for many years and TV writer. And then I moved back here. So these are two different worlds, and you're about to hear from stories of how these two worlds collide, um, and I'm really excited to do that. Sorry for my dog running back and forth, but it's COVID. So. Um, so what I'd like to start with is the origin stories of all these projects, and we're going to start with... Um, in Pittsburgh, people don't know what a development officer is, what coverage is, um, what an entertainment lawyer does. We're gonna find all that out. And basically I'd like to turn it off to, uh, over to uh, Dave Waldhoff, who I had your name better before Dave, That's but- cool. um, Waldhoff's cool. You can uh, explain, you know, he, was a, he is a development officer for Larry Schumann, who has a company that does film and TV projects. And I'd like, he was on a plane reading a magazine article, which is his job, believe it or not, and if you don't mind stepping us through how you came across an article from Jean Marie and then how that led into finding the article that would become concussion. For sure, for sure. So from, I guess, pretty early on, you know, you could option different types of things or things can be books, become movies, short stories, whatever. But I gravitated towards articles. And one of the things is uh, I thought they're very well written and it's easier to get people to read articles than it is to get them to read books. And so I subscribed to a, and I subscribed to a number of different magazines and they would kind of stack up in the closet and, and at my best productive time is on a plane. Um, and so I would always grab a stack of magazines and they could be, you know, from three years ago uh, and would go through them. And so uh, I was I had an issue of GQ, I think I was flipping through. And a lot of the times, even when you're reading, I'm looking for source materials for story, but there's so many stories, I'm not reading every article. You're almost looking for a reason to move on to the next. And I remember having the, the GQ article and I was flipping through and I was really focused on TV at that time. And I was flipping through and there's, a, uh, there's an article called, I think it was Underworld about written by Jean Marie Laskis um, about coal miners. And my initial thought was, okay, let's move on. And I'm like, well, let me just start reading a paragraph to give me an excuse to then dismiss it because what do I care about coal miners? And as I remember it, the, 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 like, it was like two thirds of the, pit of the page was, it was a graphic and one third was the article and it you know started off like you know down below in the mind the the walls are white and i was like what white you know because you always visualize in your mind a dark mind and so one of the things that really I, and i kept going and like all of g marie's great writing nothing was what i expect or is what you might expect so after the plane landed and i got back to los angeles i tracked g marie down and uh you know told her who i was and what i've done and i actually had uh, done something with a, another journalist and uh, who worked at Esquire, just threw his name out, Tom Kirella. And, you know, G. Marie can tell you this is wrong, but as I remember it, uh, she reached out to Tom to say, you know, is this Dave guy legitimate? Is he a decent person? And um, so lo and behold, um, you know, we started working with that to, um, to, to try to make that into a television show. Um, along the way, you know, became a super fan and read all of G. Marie's past work and continuing work. And uh, I don't remember, I'm sure she told me about the story. I can't remember if she, if she sent me an advanced copy or if it was when the magazine came out and she sent me a copy when it came out. But nonetheless, she, she tipped me off to the story that she was working on about Dr. Bennett Amalo and this story about Gamebrain. And I thought, oh my God, that sounds like a fantastic story. And 
you know, one of the things that, um, you know, again, I was, I was like, this feels more like a movie than a TV. And I was really like a TV guy. And I'm thinking, well, maybe there's like a, you know, HBO movie in it, which sort of like, it's kind of like TV, but it's a movie. And because um, I had no movie contacts. And the, the, one of the great things about the article was that, um, you know, you can have an article about a great character. You can have an article that's a great story. And this particular article had both. And um, so thankfully, Jean Marie entrusted me with this article, um, put me in contact with Dr. Bennett Amalu, who was you know, the Will Smith character. We got him on board. There's a funny story I can tell about that. Um, and then, you know, we were kind of uh, off to the races. So thank you so much. And, and this is so helpful because there are people, I don't even know if Jean Marie knows this part of the story. So I'd like to just talk to Jean Marie a second and get her point of view about um, when you came across, you come across a lot of stories, but when you came across Bennett's story, did you think, oh, this is a movie? And at what point did you even know it was an article? How do you discover, and of course you probably were surprised when you heard from Dave, did you have any sense of, oh yeah, this could be a movie? So if you could talk us through a little bit about what made it a story that you needed to tell and then how you got around the idea that it might be a TV show or a movie. Okay, so first of all, it's important to state that I had no thought in my brain whatsoever that it would be a could be a movie or a TV show or I just don't even think that way. I knew and still know very little but nothing about this whole world of this form of storytelling was, you know, other than being a consumer of it, I don't think that way. I didn't certainly then think that way. I just thought of stories and I wasn't interested in particularly football. I wasn't interested particularly in um, neuroscience, although, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, generally. Um, but it was really Bennett Omalu, this character. I mean, you all alone in a morgue at 4 a.m., secretly cutting open brains. Um, and you know a young guy who who's on a hunt for to to solve a mystery and not know you have a good story i mean you know it was a good story and that's sort of all these things um and a good story is a good story i don't care what the is um so for me it was less like i want to recreate this guy create the the drama and the tension of what this guy walking it through like a narrative but that's fun for me. That's just what I do in you know my work. So this was a good one. By the way, Jean Marie, uh, you actually are breaking up a little bit. So since we have limited time, I want you to just answer one thing. We'll move on and we'll come back today. But at some point, because you're where a lot of people, there are great, as you know, great writers all through the university, great people working on great research and other projects. At what point did you have to, from your point of view, when you got Dave, was this just a strange process? At what point did you start to realize, oh, I need to learn about this world? I'm shutting off my video so it works a little better. Um, can you can you nod if you can hear me okay? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, no, I... Um, I, as soon as I started talking to Dave and he reached out to me, I, I really, wow, that is another universe. And to me, it was like, what we do on the East Coast telling stories and publishing um, is what they need on the West Coast. They need content. And we're like, that's what we do. It seemed like the two coasts weren't talking to each other. That's what struck me. And, and, um, it was fun to learn that process because it was completely unknown. Well, that's why I'm so glad the Center of Creativity is doing this because that's exactly what we're here to do tonight. And then if I can introduce Kevin, um, I knew Kevin appropriately from LA, although he uh, is a Pitt graduate and he can tell you briefly, he ended up, I was working with a guy named John DeLaverson who's an alumni here and he was trying to help change the tax credit. He helped start a studio called Lionsgate. And he introduced me to some people at Lionsgate. And they were trying to make a movie called Pride about an African-American swim coach who had a Philly swim team. And as they were talking to me about it, it turns out Kevin was the one who found that story and got the life rights. 
So Kevin, I, you've worked both in Hollywood and here, and you have a list of credits in TV and film, but you knew nothing and you were, you know, working in broadcasting here and elsewhere. Can you talk about how you found Jim Ellis' story, which by the way, is on the wall at Westinghouse. So anyone could have found it. But could you tell us how you found it and, and what the process was for you to take it and make it into a movie and get it sold to Lionsgate? Absolutely. Um, so I was actually uh, invited to a birthday party for Coach Walt Harris, the pit football coach um, at the facility. And uh, I went over and hung out with, at the time, uh, Walt's girlfriend, who sat at the table and did what happens to everybody that likes to write uh, screenplays or likes to write. She just kept nagging me about, I got the, a great idea for a story, which I'm sure every single one of us has heard that. And again, I would never have to work in this business if I got a dime from everybody that said that to me. So to that end, um, I, she told me the story. It went in one ear out the other. I was dismissive. Two days later, I received Pitt Football Manila envelope with uh, uh, Xerox newspaper articles about Jim Ellis. Well, I felt guilty if I didn't follow up on it. So I, uh, I went to introduce myself and spent two days and talked him into signing a life rights. Now, he was reluctant at first, but then he never believed it would be turned into anything. So he said, yeah, go whatever you're going to do. To that end, I wrote it, um, the script. Uh, I had a, a good friend, and this is interesting because David will completely understand this. I had a good friend who worked at a small production company as a development executive. And he happened to be visiting in Pittsburgh at the time to do a story in the Johnstown flood. And he had to fly back on the red eye to California on a Sunday night. And he said, uh, oh crap, I didn't read anything this weekend to take to our Monday morning development meeting. I said, well, here, here's my script. That way you can BS your way through it. He read it on the airplane, pitched it at the meeting, called me up that afternoon and said, hey, the company wants to go to Lionsgate with this. And uh, from that point on, uh, it went to Lionsgate. And as far as the life rights are concerned, um, it's interesting because what I, I write my main purpose or my main focus is our biopics, which means I'm constantly getting life rights, whether it's from source material or for individuals. So to that end, how do you go about doing that? Well, first, you have to make sure you kind of not only meet the person, but let them know that your job's not to do a biography. It's not a documentary, but you want to protect who they are and catch, catch the spirit of what they've tried to achieve. Then at that point, it becomes a negotiating moment, um, whereas it can range anywhere from $3,000 to $1 for life rights. Obviously, source material, if you're going to go straight off of that, it's going to cost you a little more. But uh, you can write something, a back-end deal with the person when you get the life rights. With Jim Ellis, uh, we put a little bit back-end um, deal with it, and then we also were able to get him a cameo. So he gets uh, um, a credit uh, from the Screen Actors Guild, so that, and that's for perpetuity. So to that end, that compensated for working in the life rights. Since I'm about to toss it to our, our last series of guests here, I wanted you to set up a little, because pitching is not easy, and I know you're great at it. If you can give us uh, the log line, because that'll take us to Asher, uh, you know, what's a two minute thing when you said, oh, this guy is a swim coach from Pittsburgh, who cares? So what, right. how would you tell people when they're getting on the plane, read the script it's about? Right. Uh, okay, so here's, my, here's the elevator pitch, um, and that is simply this. Um, for years, people thought that uh, Blacks never could swim or were bad at swimming. Well, there just happens to be an African-American from Pittsburgh who not only became a swimmer himself, but became the most prominent swim coach in the United States, uh, leading a team of, of young people from Philadelphia, inner city, who never knew how to swim to become the most prominent and most prolific swim team in the country in just a matter of a few years. These always seem so obvious once they get made. You're like, what a great movie. But of course, <laughs> things usually take years. So there's a guy in Hollywood. I have a bunch of books here, some of which are people who are on the meeting and some, there's, there's, I've got tons of books from people from Pitt and Pittsburgh who um, have books that could become this. But in Hollywood, even though I never knew about it and I got a weird scholarship to Universal, the first job I had was reading scripts and doing coverage. Coverage is not a term a lot of people know here, but there was a guy named Asher Garfinkel who happens to have a daughter who's a freshman at Pitt, I'm happy to say, um, who lives in Los Angeles and has a reader service. And Asher came across this book called Dear Zoe. And I'd like him to just tell the story briefly of explain what a reader service is and why most studios and other production companies frequently need a reader service, and then how you came across this book and then sent it for coverage, and then we'll go over to the author. 
Thanks, Carl. So yeah, I have a coverage service called uh, simply called Readers Unlimited. It started way back in 2001. And um, essentially what coverage is, it's like the book report, but for, uh, for uh, material that is intended or might have a goal of becoming uh, filmed or, or uh, videoed entertainment. Um, and coverage will include usually a, a synopsis, a, uh, a couple of pages of comments, uh, as well as a top sheet that includes the log line that, uh, that Carl was just talking about. And it's used for a few things. It could be used for, oh, you're sharing your screen there, are you? Uh, it's used for a few things. It's used for uh, a, a writer or a producer, directors looking for feedback on their material. Uh, it's used for sales. It can also be used uh, really just to weed through volumes of submissions that might be coming into a, uh, a production company, a studio, a director, or what have you, uh, because that individual or that company can't get to uh, all of those themselves, but they don't want to miss something that is really, really good. So I have the coverage of Dear Zoe that I, I should have asked Philip's permission, but it's in your book. You've actually written the book on story analysis. But can you just briefly tell the story of uh, that book? Thank you very much, which I've given that copy to a million people, so I need to get more. But um, so you ended up reading this book. Am I seen or should I stop sharing? Anyway, you can see here quickly, it has a log line. I'll go through this while you're talking, but say what it was about Philip's book that got your attention, then we'll go to Philip and then we'll go to another guest panelist and then open it up. Audiences, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat. Um, but go ahead, uh, Asher. What was when, it about this book that got your yeah? Opinion? When when um, you know, I I knew Phil growing up in Pittsburgh, and um, you know, when Phil sent it to me, it, it really had everything going on for it that I was kind of seeking at that time. Carl, I was just starting to talk to you about seeking uh, Pittsburgh content uh, set in Pittsburgh, written by Pittsburghers. Um, and uh, it, you know, it was about a, a young woman who uh, had a desire to, uh, you know, emerge from from pain and during a painful, very painful, you know, era in our history. And uh, so, and, and heck, you know, you you, you make uh, the setting uh, of any film or uh, book, Kennywood, and you know, I'm going to have to take a look at that. So, uh, I think Kennywood is one of the stars of of that uh, <laughs> of that book. So, I gave it a read. I had to give it a read, and was really excited, and, and I absolutely loved it. And it just sort of was in sync with you know what what my radar was seeking at that time. And um, so, you know, immediately I I did talk to Carl about it, and I got it covered. Uh, and I had no doubt that the reader, this was totally objective read, I gave this book to a, a female reader and um, she took a look at it and came back with covers that did not surprise me. It was strong recommend, which is, which is rarely, rarely, rarely given to, to anyone with coverage. And wow. so uh, Carl and I took a look at that and we started using that as sort of a sales tool. Um, before I, I am in trouble doing with the technology, so I'm just going to read a sentence from the coverage that your reader, who wasn't from Pittsburgh and doesn't know Kennywood, said, on top of very unusually giving high marks for dialogue and, and we can do all the other things, there hasn't a voice this real, this emotive, and this honest in contemporary literature in quite some time. It is with, uh, without a doubt a remarkable feat by a writer to achieve a transcendent insight into the suffering of a 15-year-old girl. And then uh, I will now introduce that writer, Philip, who was actually an attorney who uh, got inside the head of a 15 year old. And uh, if you could briefly, uh, obviously you have a great story. The book almost didn't get published and, and you know this was your side gig and you studied here at Pitt with Buddy Norton. But could you talk briefly, the idea of getting a book into a movie, you love movies, I know Philip, we've had extensive yeah. conversations. But can you talk a little bit about what that process was like First, you finished this book and through Against All Odds, you got it published, but then the idea of it being a movie, you know, how that happened. And it just got made this last year after literally 15 years. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to introduce one more person and then we'll open it up a little more. Yeah, sure. I mean, as you know, it's been a very long ride that started with a, started with Asher, started with, I call him Garf, started with Garf reading the book and, and, and handing it to you and then 
Carl and I had a meeting um, at the Aspenwall Grill a million years ago now, and and Carl just started handing it to people. Um, and uh, my understanding is that's really the way it happens. You know, people who know people who know people. And uh, it was interesting how and fitting how it eventually came back to Pittsburgh. It ended up in the hands of um, a producer and his wife who uh, the producer had gone to Shadyside Academy and uh, he and his wife read it and loved it. And, and my wife at the time then and I met them at a coffee shop in Shadyside and, and they told us how this was going to happen. They didn't tell us it was going to take 12 years. But yeah. uh, well, ironically, Mark, who ended up optioning it, uh, read the most books in fifth grade when I first was a scholarship <laughs> at Shadyside. So it pays to read. Only in uh, Hollywood does it end up that you learn out that reading actually is a profession that you can really get paid big bucks for. Not that you can't get paid nicely as a writer, but to that end, and if you want to segue, I'm going to introduce Gary Barkin, who's the entertainment attorney who actually uh, did the deal for Jean Marie and Revenant. But if you want to summarize why one might want to get an entertainment attorney, and whatever words you want to say. Yeah, I, I can't remember how the old saying goes, but you know, it, it's something about you know an attorney uh, representing himself as a fool for a client, and uh, so I decided that I was going to represent myself in this negotiation with this producer because it was a friend of Carl's. He's a Pittsburgh guy, you know. It'll just be a handshake deal and a quick little letter, and so that's what we had. And um, it was missing a little thing called reversionary rights, um, which I didn't learn until many years later is fairly standard that if the film doesn't get made in X number of years, whether even though you've been paid already, the rights revert to you. Um, so I was waiting around for all of these years and, and it just wasn't happening, wasn't happening. And I could have gotten the project back and, and gotten ownership of it again if Gary had represented me in my negotiation <laughs> with Mark. Well, it's fine because Jean Marie just met on person, and so I'll introduce Gary briefly. And uh, that cautionary story hopefully will help a lot of people who are on this call. Um, so, Gary, I know actually I was at William Morris, so my agent was, and Gary was in house at there. Uh, Gary went to Harvard, Harvard Law School. He's done many things, he's done stand up comedy, other things, but he also has produced movies, and he's a great attorney who was in house at Sony and then has his own boutique agency. Uh, representing a variety of different people. Um, Gary, just for the purposes of this, could you just talk a little bit about why, and Dave, I don't know, you and Dave can start talking because maybe I should ask Dave first and then go to Gary, but you can say hi, Gary. And then Dave, if you could talk about why it was important to get for Jean Marie to be represented and for Dr. Malo to, uh, Dr. yeah, so go ahead. Sure, so um, basically, um, you know, I forget, you know, there's there's different types and Gary, I'll talk more about this, I'm sure, but you can have what's called a shopping agreement, which is basically just a handshake saying, well, everybody will negotiate their deal when we set it up, or you could fully like have a fully negotiated deal. And so uh, at that point in time, um, uh, for a period of time, we had the equivalent of a shopping agreement or a handshake agreement with Jean Marie and, and Dr. Malu. And then we, we got uh, Harpo, which is Oprah Winfrey's company at the time, interested in the project. And they had just gone through a situation where that was not good enough for them. So they wanted a fully negotiated deal. And so, yeah, you always want an entertainment attorney to do the deals versus like, oh, my friend's a real estate attorney, he can handle it. You, you don't want to do that. And so um, Gary was, um, uh, I know Gary's a friend of Larry's um, and we've worked with him before. And, um, um, and so we felt like, you know, Gary would be the right type of person who knows all these types of deals who could really look out for Jean Marie and, and, and Bennett's best interest. Uh, so Gary, uh, yeah. Sure, um, and, and yeah, so I had gotten the call and I, I actually just pulled out the old agreements and I realized, wow, it's been a decade. But um, in two, back in 2010, I got the call from Dave um, about this project and that uh, you know both Bennett and Jean Marie needed to be represented because it was time to do a real option agreement for in, in Bennett's case, it was the life story rights for you know basically the subject matter of the article. And then in Jean Marie's case, it was for the rights to the article because you don't want to get one without the other because you want to tie up, you know, if you're the production company, you want to tie up as many so, in, sources of information about this, whatever your subject matter is. 
So um, if you can get the article, that's great, but you also, if you can get the subject of the article, that's even better. So um, I met Bennett and I met Jean Marie back then. And basically uh, we did a, a, an option deal for them to license respectively their um, life story rights and uh, the article um, over to the Schumann company. And then the Schumann company in turn made a deal to produce the film. Um, ultimately, you know, it, 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 there were several more years and then finally it ultimately uh, got greenlit for production with Sony. Carl, you're muted. Thank you. Um, that's one of the things that you can say, Dave, that you're probably getting a sense now hearing all these stories that it's very rare. I was lucky that my first movie got made. You know, Kevin had a fairly turn quick turnaround, but a lot of times these movies take years. So Dave, you ended up, it, it didn't get made. Ironically, Oprah was doing another Jean Marie Laskus, uh, I think she was she your student, Rebecca Sklutz, Immortal La Lives of Henrietta Lacks. And you ended up having to take it somewhere else. So it was important that you and Jean Marie, that she had control of the rights, right, Dave? Right, and, and so fortunately, you know, Harpo didn't have the rights, we did. And so, um, you know, after a period of time, I don't know, call it a year or so, and, you know, we were always, you know, next in queue, but, you know, you never really know what's going on with HBO. And, you know, famously, HBO never passes on anything. They still haven't passed on Mad Men, um, <laughs> supposedly. And um, uh, so they would say, you know, hey, we're behind, and we were behind Henrietta Lacks, which, you know, came out not that long ago, came out after a concussion. Um, so ultimately, you know, we wound up having an amicable parting. And, you know, I think it was a blessing in disguise because along the way, you know, I, felt like I, this really should be a feature theatrical film versus a TV movie. And was really excited to sort of pursue that angle of it. And so, like I said, it takes many years, but you're knocking a lot of doors. <clears throat> and when you see the movies, it's all worth it. And of course, concussion really not only changed, uh, you know, it really helped change policy at the NFL and around the country and, and had an impact. Um, if I can briefly, um, I, I, we want to open this up to questions. So Shannon is, I, I think, uh, monitoring the chat, or if people want to raise their hand, um, we can get to those because we'll continue talking. Um, I do want to mention, this is a book uh, by a guy named Fred Rogers. And I want to tell you a brief story of the history of Pitt and copyright. Because we know how to do this in sciences, because Jonas Salk did a vaccine here. And you may know he didn't patent it. He could have made a billion dollars, and he didn't. And that's a great thing. But ever since then, the scientists know how to patent their work. Uh, there's a guy named Fred Rogers and a guy named George Romero. We now have the George Romero archives here at Pitt. George famously made Night of the Living Dead that did not get copyrighted. So anyone in the world could do the, show the movie. The distributor made 30 million. George and all his colleagues from Pittsburgh made bupkis. There was a guy named Fred Rogers, who Jean Marie knew for a long time and wrote a wonderful article about. Fred, when he was a quiet guy and moved back here from NBC, was doing Children's Corner, sold a song for $100, and then someone explained to him that he didn't own that song anymore. So wonderful Mr. Rogers decided to own every single thing he had. So when friends ended up producing the new movie with Tom Hanks, they came to me and I said, well, you can't do it. Oh, yes, we can do it. And they go, well, you need to go through the Fred Rogers company. Oh, no, we can get around. Oh, no. So six months later, they call back. So you want to be Fred Rogers in every sense. He believed media could make good attractive, but you also want to manage your own lights. And the Fred Rogers company still owns all the rights to everything Mr. Rogers. So that's the moral of our little story. I know there's a lot of people, uh, does anybody have a particular question? Because I'd like to go back and ask everybody what they learned from that experience and what advice they have. But if we have anybody who wants to jump in, please uh, chat or raise your hand. Um, Shannon, are you around somewhere? Because I can't. I'm, I'm here, Carl. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions in the chat. People would uh, really like to know about the process of getting their idea uh, pitched. So, how do you start that process? Um, a couple, one, one in particular asked, you know, uh, I'm writing a book, I'm partway through. Does it make sense to finish it or <laughs> should I just turn it in as kind of a treatment on steroids? Uh, well, while you're doing that, Shannon, since we're, this is, feels like a talk show, game show host thing. <laughs> The Center for Creativity has just what they're looking for. Tell them what they've won. There's a new thing, and I don't know if I want to embarrass Kit or not. Somebody came up with a great uh, little tag, Pitch, P-I-T-T-C-H. Now on the website where you signed up for this on the Center for Creativity, tell them what's on there, Shannon, if you don't mind. Oh, okay, great. So you can go to our website, uh, creative.pit.edu, and there's a form there that you can fill out. Um, we'll be 
selecting a certain number of um, pitches and uh, sending them to Asher for coverage. So, and, and that link is now in the chat. So I guess the question is, how do you pitch something? And I'm guessing, Dave, you maybe start or Kevin, I, you both had a lot of experience in Hollywood developing projects. What's your advice when people say, I've got a great story, but it's not on paper? Well, I mean, uh, it sounds like they're writing a book. They're not pitching the book to get published. They're all of a sudden trying to skip that step and, and have it become a, a, a movie or a TV show. I mean, I think that, you know, as I don't know if it's Kevin or somebody else, written, it's all about, you know, relationships and connections. And so, you know, people want sort of warm introduction. So, you know, if the cold email comes in or the cold query comes in, it's very hard to get a response, let alone a read, as opposed to if you, you know, hey, I was referred by so-and-so, your, your other client or your high school, you know, classmate or whatever the case may be. So I think it's like a lot of times, and, and I think it's true for everybody, it's true for me when I'm trying to reach out to people, everybody's always punching higher if I'm trying to reach out to some, you know, big shot director or whatever, um, or, I'm always trying to look for like what kind of connection I can have so it's not just a cold call, so it's not just this. And of course, you know, the other thing is, you know, credits help and, you know, credits don't necessarily be, you know, things that were made. Credits can be anything from, you know, I won a Nichols Fellowship or, you know, in the local paper, I won Best Story. Anything that sort of gives you a little bit of credibility in the writing or somebody might be interested, you know, like I won some person who had worked for uh, the Obama administration and so that intrigued me, you know? So um, I think those are the types of things, almost like in crafting in your, in your reach out, just even sort of get a response, things that about your bio or about yourself that might be intriguing to somebody else that they wanna talk more or think you might have a reason, you know, to, because we all get, you know, it's, it's all, you know, needle in a haystack, you know, looking for stuff, so. People should know that there's 80,000 scripts a year registered at the Writers Guild and anyone can go to WGA.org and, get on there, but the truth is finding something good. And most producers will not read scripts that are submitted over the transom because they don't want to get sued. Oh, wait, by the way, my neighbor literally said, Jean Marie, about 10 years ago, hey, I'm suing the NFL. This is a great story. You should make a movie about it. But that doesn't make it a movie. Jean Marie writing that article makes it a movie. My neighbor probably still negotiating those rights. But uh, Kevin, I know you also teach pitching. Do you have anything in pitching? And we have a lot of questions. So Shannon, feel free. Yeah, I'll make it, I'll make it fast. And that is um, know what your material is. In other words, if you've written something, just how Carl asked me a second ago, hey, give me the pitch. Now I haven't pitched pride in God knows how many years, but I have an understanding of what, what it is. Uh, to that end, I'll give you a really quick example. Um, and, I, and I know in my classes, I try to work with the students to teach how to pitch. Do what's called an elevator pitch. Be able to tell your story in five minutes or under. Uh, a good example that I can give you is years ago, uh, I, uh, from the tsunami in uh, Southeast Asia in 2004, there was a story about a 120 year old tortoise and a baby hippo that became best friends. And I said, boy, that looks so Disney-esque. Uh, it just so happened at the same time, another guy and his daughter saw that same story. And so they wrote a children's book. And so I just wrote mine anyway for the heck of it. Fast forward, oh, 12, 13 years. And just for the heck of it, I said, you know, I think I'll call that guy up, you know, what the heck? So I, I, I found his phone number and I called him up, left a message on his voicemail at work and said, hey, uh, you know, I wrote the script. You have the book, you know, you, uh, no worry about life rights. They're animals, for God's sake. So we're in good shape. To that end, I figured, OK, I hung up. I'm never going to hear from him. He calls me back from his car phone. It was a guy named Craig Hatkoff. And Craig calls me back from his car phone and says, hey, give me your elevator pitch. So I literally gave him the elevator pitch in five minutes. He goes, send me the script. I want to read it. Two days later, uh, my agent was flying to New York to meet with them to put together a deal. Now, Craig Hatkoff, as you, I'm, I'm sure some of you know who Craig is. He's the, uh, he, his ex-wife, Jane Rosenthal, and uh, Robert De Niro founded the Tribeca Film Festival. But he's also a publisher. So he has all kinds of material. But I, my theory was simply this, be fearless. What, what's, what's he going to do? Say no, which it's a rejection-based business. The bottom line is all you need is one yes. I get 5 million no's. I just need one yes. So that's my approach when I go to pitch, but I know my material. Every single thing I wrote, I can tell you in five minutes. Well, I think everyone here will tell you stories about how things took years to get made. So you yeah. have to, you know, find projects you believe in 
Yeah. Ideas are easy. You know, saying, hey, I want to do a movie about guys, people hang out in a bar doesn't make it cheers. Um, and they try to remake St. Elmo's Fire many a time thinking, well, put kids in a bar and it'll be a movie. It's not, you know, if it's a character-based thing, write it yourself. I think part of that story is some people wrote it. It's a lot easier. You have to write. And yeah. if you don't write, find a great Pitt Writers Program graduate and pay them some money and let them write your story and then deal, get Gary to do the uh, option. Is there another question that you, uh, Shannon, that you want to? Yeah, actually, to go off what you were just saying, uh, a question that came in said, how do you continue to write day after day? What happens when you're under contract with a story you don't particularly like? And to go off this, did any of you get writer's block when you were under contract? Um, I can tell you quite simply, but I I'll just complain here. I came here accidentally to teach. I wasn't going to stay. Um, Gary knew me then. I was on a show, some of the spinoffs of Saved by the Bell, and Gary and I would have coffee. I had a beautiful house at Sunset Strip, and I'd say, Gary, I really don't want to do this, and he, like, they're paying me, they pay you tens of thousands a week, and I'm like, he added up, like, 43 weeks, and he's like, you really want to leave that on the table? But the way they keep making you write in L.A. is they take your house. If you do not finish, they say, you know that house you love? We are removing that from you, and you will never work again. But that's not what most people face here. So if anybody, I know Jean Marie, you write all the time and you have students. Is there anything that you tell them uh, about to encourage them in terms of writing? And Philip, I know you had to go, you, you've written many a book now. You know, how, you've got a day job, so you're a good example. So maybe you two could talk about writer's block a little. Well, if, you're, if you don't have writer's block, you're, you're just not writing. I mean, that just, part of it that goes with it you're you always i mean i always have writer's block hold on i'm gonna stop my video so it doesn't flicker um and in terms of like writing under contract and how you keep going and what if it's not something that you like writing i, I mean turn it into something that you do like writing um for example my editor asked me to look up up this concussion stuff that is not my interest at all not my field I was like, Ugh, really? Football? Concussions? Really? Um, but then I kept researching until I found something that was my kind of story. So I think you just like play to your strengths and do what you love and tell the story that you love. It's always coming from stories, you know, and you eventually fall in love with your characters. You eventually fall in love with your, the content. And then you're just having, you know, it's joyful. Um, that's sort of like what I try to do is find, find the stuff that you know, the reason I'm in it, you know? Ironically, Bennett himself didn't like football and that might have been your way in because he didn't even know the game really. So, um, and Philip, I have one of your latest books that somebody out there will option to so make sure you get the life rights <laughs> or the rights swing. But like, how do you keep writing? And you know, you've had to do this on the side this whole time. Yeah, I mean, my type of writing is obviously a lot different than Jean Marie's. I mean, with a novel, you're sort of committing a year or two of your life to a story so if you don't if you don't love it uh you're not going to start it i mean if you haven't found a story that grabs you hard enough um to keep you coming to the to the desk every day then you haven't got the right story um i will give a, a brief bit of advice that was given to me by another novelist um i had written short stories in in high school and college but always sort of knew that um, the novel is where I would live if I ever decided to, to actually write. And I asked him the same question, how do you do this day after day? And do you map it all out in advance? Or, and, and he said to me that writing a novel is like taking a road trip in your car at night. You can't see where you're headed, but you know you're getting somewhere. And you just write as far as the headlights every day. And that, as far as the headlights might be half a page, might be one page, might be two pages. Um, but if you do that every day for 365 days, you've got a pretty big stack of pages at the end of the year. Um, I want to just put a shout out, especially since he's no longer with us, but, and also to everybody about writing classes. You know, we're lucky that Kevin now comes back here and teaches broadcasting and screenwriting. And, and Jean Marie has wonderful people she's nurtured through the writing program who also are not teaching. And, uh, you took a class with Buddy Norton. So taking classes, I, I think they were, that was just like extra classes, right, Philip? So that helps give a little structure. Yeah, I was in law school at the time and taking graduate fiction writing on the side with Buddy. 
And the best thing about writing classes, nobody's going to teach you how to write. You, you write, you learn how to write by writing. But writing classes is a group of people that treat one another as writers. Um, and if you're not being treated as a writer, it's easy to sort of be in a room and think, am I a writer? Am I a writer? Am I a writer? But you go to a class and people are talking seriously about this sentence or this paragraph that you've written, and it makes you feel like a writer. Um, the tricky thing, though, is knowing who to listen to. Um, you don't want to listen to everybody in the room. Uh, yeah. I think that's the hard thing and what we hope to help in the Center of Creativity the hard thing is writing screenplays, as you found out eventually, is a different animal. And in LA, there's a lot of people who are working writers and agents. And, and here, there are very few who are part of the Writers Guild or do this for a living. So we have a lot of connections. I now have a lot of alumni in LA, and there's a lot of other people who've come out and done things. So we're hoping that we can bridge that gap. But I think it's really helpful. But Shannon, another question. I know we got a lot, and I don't mean to uh, yeah, sure. Um, the next one is uh, with more streaming services coming out like Apple TV and Disney Plus, are you seeing more potential and possibility for story ideas to turn into produced films or TV shows? And well, another question that goes with that is um, I know Netflix and other places don't take solicited submissions, um, but they don't tell you how to get them there. So any answers would be appreciated. I, uh, I Pitt and, Alex and Gary, this is so fun because Gary and I <laughs> talk about this all the time. And luckily, uh, by the way, we're taking, teaching that Pitt and LA class remotely this semester. So if you're at Pitt, you can go to the Pitt and LA study abroad. But when I was out there this last summer, Gary does deals. However you want to phrase this, Gary, you deal a lot with the internet companies. <laughs> and how has that changed the industry? And of course, it does go for usually established talent. Yeah, um, I mean, it's what, thanks to, you know, the digital age, there's a lot more buyers of product. Um, it's and especially, you know, and each new kid on the block, you know, uh, you know, first it was Netflix, then it was Amazon, now it's Apple. Um, when each one comes on, the, you know, is sort of the newcomer, they they buy tons and tons of material and they overpay for it too. So that's really good for anyone who's working in the industry um, until they figure out their models and then they decide, oh, we don't need to pay quite this much for this material. But you know, there's always a new kid on the block, and you know, each one of the, you know, when you're talking about companies like Netflix, Amazon, Apple, these are some of the absolutely wealthiest uh, companies in the world. And so therefore they're great buyers to have out there. And it, it gives uh, writers, directors, any creative talent, you know, a lot more options in terms of, you know, getting their stuff out there. Now, of course, that's also brings up the question, you know, the second part of the question is, you know, well, how do you get your, how do you get your material as it sits now unsolicited to become solicited? Um, you know, most places insist, you know, and this is just for legal protection so that they don't get sued from someone saying, hey, I sent you that story 12 years ago when I faxed it to you and, and, and now you've made it into a movie and you owe me for you know, my wonderful idea. So um, basically to sort of avoid these types of frivolous claims, um, uh, material should ideally come, most studios and other platforms want to see the material coming from ideally an agent or a manager. A lawyer can also submit it, but everyone also kind of knows anyone can hire a lawyer. I mean, people often ask me to submit material for them. I'm like, okay, I'll do it for you. But I think more often than not, when it comes from a lawyer, it goes right into a shredder. So um, if you can get an agent or a manager friend to submit for you or a producer friend um, or anyone who's in the industry with where their job is assessing creative material, as lawyers, as much as we like to think we have creative bones, people don't look at us as people that can assess creative material, but agents and managers do and producers do, and anyone that can sort of get your foot in the door. So it's all about expanding your network and increasing the people you know within the industry. You're muted, Carl. I was gonna point out you have written screenplays and Lethal Eviction is available on DVD. Yes, yeah, yeah, my, my one writing credit is available on Amazon Prime. <laughs> um, this is one of the great things because again, we have so many amazing stories at Pitt. I mean, everything from Falling Water to uh, you know the great things that happen with the Freedom House people and the development. There's a million great stories. But Asher, that's one of the reasons that we have you here and, and we're happy to have your daughter at Pitt. Can you talk a little bit about the process and how is it? Have you seen a change at all? And, and basically, who are your, you know, when studios and other people ask you to read stuff, has the quality changed at all? Is, is there anything different? 
Yeah, I, I think the, the quality is changing. I think that uh, people are doing their homework a lot more than they used to. They're, they're taking classes, they're reading the books. Uh, they're, you know, the, the mistakes that I often see are that people rush it out the door and they just think, oh, I've got the great American screenplay and this is gonna make me millions and, and that's it. And you can tell when it's rushed or when that individual just you know, hasn't done their homework. Um, to go back to the previous point, uh, you know, a lot of the, the independent producers who are my clients have started to, you know, technology has enabled them to widen their net. So suddenly they're not no longer um, such and such films or productions. They they want to go. They want media in their event or in their not their events their uh, uh, their production company title um, because now they are looking for things that they can stream. Uh, all those other you know all those other avenues for um, for distributing material are there. So it's uh, it is a bit of a new world. Um, if I can do a couple things. First of all, uh, this is a book called Zitfield Screenplay. It's been around forever. There's many books like this, but this is a very good starting place if you've never written a screenplay. You need to learn the rules for the road. Television is very similar. It's character. It tells you about format. You can go to thewriterstore.com. They can give you all these books. The, in LA, this information is easy, and we're hoping at the Center for Creativity we'll put links down. I do want to mention two things. I saw another question from one of my students about you know, how do you have to get the life rights to do stuff about biography? But before I do that, I want to say, because I see Miriam, my student, who uh, wrote a great story. I really encourage my students, and I hope Kevin and Dave, you know, people would back me up, but write your story that's unique that you haven't seen. Um, we took Miriam out to LA last year, and she told her story. I don't know if you want to pitch it or you want me to pitch it briefly, Miriam. Can you say it in a sentence, what your movie is? Um, yeah, that project was about a Chinese Jewish girl growing up in Pennsylvania um, on a quest to find a dear heart that was extra credit for her science class while training for her bat mitzvah. So, Dave, have you heard that story before? Is that I was going to say again. I mean, I've <laughs> twice today. I've said that already. <laughs> so that, at the very least, is a great writing sample. And it's better to write that story than to write a story that anybody could write. Right. Because then, you know, I get a sense of her sensibility. So, because I know everyone thinks they got a great story, but start with the ones that you need to tell. And like Kevin saw, when he pitched that story about Jim Elsie, he thought what made it unique. Um, I know Aditi had asked about uh, whether you need to, what was this question, Aditi, you can ask yourself. And then Shannon, you can set up the next question, but I have to know these people, so. Hi, yeah, it was about um, kind of the gray area between when you need to actually get life rights and when it's based on a true story or inspired by a true story, but not necessarily all focused on just one character's story, but maybe an ensemble of characters or a combination of things, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, if you don't mind, I, I can jump on that one. Uh, that's my world a lot. Uh, there's two things. First of all, that's based on, as opposed to inspired by, based on it follows the character and the storyline of the person you're trying to tell very closely, although it's not regurgitating, it's not biography. Inspired by is more in the spirit of, for example, Pride, For uh, it was uh, an ensemble cast because it's a swim team, but instead of taking it from the 20 years Jim was coaching, I did an amalgamation of all the athletes that he coached and made it into one team over the course of one year. So now, because I didn't follow it strictly as, as it happened, it was inspired by true events, as opposed to based on true events. So uh, if that's the way to answer it, and when you're working with trying to get life rights for anything that includes an ensemble, uh, I always start from number one, who is my lead? Because if I'm telling the story through the lead character's eyes, the ancillary characters, uh, unless they're as prominent, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, for example, you need, you know, obviously I'm just using that as, a, as an example, but you, you can't just get Butch without getting Sundance, right? But that being said, for an ensemble cast, if you have a primary character that you're going to tell the story through, that's the life rights you need to get. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have a lot of questions. Shannon, you can jump in, or uh, I like when we get to hear people and see people. 
By the way, one of the things we are looking for is diverse stories. We don't need another action hero movie that takes place in outer space. So there's probably great contests you can go to and do things like that. But really, I think what Pittsburgh's strong suit in Pitt is, is the stories people haven't heard, the voices that need to be told. Um, and you know, I'm really proud of my students who are working on those. And I know there's a lot of people at Pitt. But Shannon, do you have another question so I can? Yeah. So uh, what kind of production related jobs are out there for STEM majors, especially if it's related to screenwriting? Uh, I can tell you right now at the Center for Creativity, we, we're doing a movie now about vaccines. There's a lot of documentaries that are sciences. We've been trying to cross this bridge. Working in production is its own separate thing. Kevin, I know you teach a lot of broadcasting and there is a lot of production. I'm part of a Pitt and Hollywood group that I'm an advisor for. There's a lot of production that just goes on. But the first thing for production, do you have any advice, anybody who's been in production? Um, everything you learned, and in fact, I, I'd love to hear from uh, the rest of this panel because I think they would probably say the same thing. Every single element that you learn can turn, you're going to need that for your writing purposes. Um, you know, I, I, I've had the most bizarre experiences with scripts and stories when I'm writing. And number one is learn how to research. You know, I'm a big fan of research. I, I can do that all day long. But the other part is, is that little things that you'd never think in a million years that you'd need. Um, thoracic surgery information. I actually had to learn about that to write a script. So I'd love to hear from the other panelists because everything I've learned somewhere it shows up eventually. I think that's a great point. If you're talking about, especially from a writer point of view, um, you know, what has Johnny Carson said, you'll use everything you've ever learned. And I can't tell you if you're like, let's say a, an aspiring TV writer or TV writer, you know, you might think, well, why should I mention my mom as a brain surgeon, you know, but there may be a show about brain surgery that's looking to staff up. And there might be somebody who gets that email from you who's like, wow, I know they're looking for a young writer who has some knowledge of brain surgery as a writer and boom. So, so those little things, you just, you, you never can tell you know, with, you know, Larry Schumann, who represents a lot of, um, uh, established TV writers. Um, one of the things we would do is we'd go through his clients and look for something obscure, like this person was the voice of Hey Arnold on on the show, which is actually one of Kerry Barkin's clients. Um, or, uh, <laughs> this person was in Stomp the Yard, or you know, just some rando that you know this person played for you know football under this famous coach. You know, anything because you just you just never know. And so those types of things, and especially if you think like just. If you had a law background, of course, there's so many legal shows, but think of our political background. There's a, there's a writer who was um, uh, the son of um, someone who worked like for Clinton in the State Department, and he's a good writer, um, but I'm sure the fact that he could say that he had this knowledge of the State Department that other people wouldn't have was interesting. So I think if you're talking about writing, yeah, everything uh, is relevant. And in fact, you know, if you think about Hollywood, they're not thinking like, well, yeah, are we looking for a thoracic surgeon? You might be like, probably, because someone probably needs that information out there, that you just got to find them. <clears throat> well, I'm going to bring this up because these are having been back and forth between these two worlds for 20 years. And I'm going to put this at Jean Marie's feet, but probably a lot of other people on here. One of the big problems is we have great scientists who have great stories, but we don't have enough English majors who are getting paid by those scientists to help them write these grants and stories, the world would be a better place. You know, there is a guy who did uh, Code Black, who's a Pitt medical graduate. I mean, if you look in Pitt Med Magazine, I mean, but you need, we need to consciously do this. It can't just be randomly. We've got to have, I don't know if Rory Cooper's on the call. I know he has an amazing story I've been trying to tell for years, but you know, you've got to find the passionate writers. If you don't want to write it yourself and you're a STEM major, hang around writers and vice versa. If you only hang around your students who are doing film and you don't meet these other kids, you don't have a story to tell. You have a story to tell that's just like every other story. So that's my little rant, sorry, but Shannon, keep me going. All right, so um, as a high school student, are there any ways to begin getting involved in the industry, particularly writing and directing and learning the basics? Um, outs like opportunities like internships um, can be difficult to find. So do you have any recommendations? From high school, um, you know, 
Uh, the one thing, you know, I, I saw one of these questions was about advice, you know, and so one thing that I would advice I would give on notes, which then I in turn, which notes are when you're giving people advice on a script, which then in turn I gave to myself, which is if you had to do it, you know, I know this is an impossible idea, but if you had to do it, what would you do? You know, what would you do? So I, there's not a lot of stories about high school interns. If you were in college, then I could think of that. But I, I go back to be creative. What would you do? You know, I, well, okay, what would I do? I'd probably look and see, you know, is there a producer that does a lot of sort of like YA books or why should maybe that they, they would love to have somebody sort of young making Xeroxes um, because that's somebody they can, you know, talk to. Uh, I know we're in the COVID era now. Um, people are maybe like, I want to see if this YA book resonates. Like I'll sometimes I'll, I have a niece um, and, you know, when she was 16, I would say, hey, can you read this book? What do you think? Does this resonate with you? Because I think it's pretty cool, but maybe I'm, you know, a middle-aged guy and I don't really, it's not really good, you know? So um, it, it kind of goes back to the reach out. I don't know if there's any specific, because I've never heard of it. I, I personally, I don't have a specific idea other than just getting creative and, and, and well, trying to figure it out. And I'll, I'll just get on my soapbox, you know, learn, learn how to read scripts, read a lot of scripts. Uh, learn how to write about them, learn how to talk about story, because no matter what you do, whether you're an AD or a producer or an actor or a screenwriter, of course, an attorney, you're going to have to talk about story, you're going to have to talk about scripts and write about them at some point in your career. And thankfully, because of the digital age we live in, you know, People can, I mean, we've got all these platforms that is free to upload to YouTube. Start making your, if you're in high school and you, you've got a story that's in you, you can make a short, you can, you can write it, you can produce it, you can direct it. You know, it's, there are plenty of people who have gotten stuff discovered because it started to catch on virally because it was put on YouTube. Um, it, it's, you know, so just start creating and putting stuff out there. There's not, you know, obviously, you know, if you're, 16 in high school, you know, it's not like you can go work for a production company as anything other than maybe a summer intern, but there's nothing stopping you from starting to create content. Um, and I got to tell you, Pittsburgh has a vibrant independent film community. I know Bob Scott from Create Carnegie Screenwriters is here. You can go on a website like that, find communities. I do want to give a shout out. Last year, I had a screenwriting student who wrote a short film and we eventually got some money and, and made it locally. And um, that movie, thanks to her, Sam Orlowski just dropped it on YouTube a month ago and it has over 200,000 views. Wow. And again, it was a really important story about gender identity. I hope we're gonna be able to do a screening of that and really talk about how that got made. But for your generation, the TikTok generation, you're content creators. So I think what we really need is the university to start recognizing that this is a particular skill set that the people are gonna need for the future and that high school students grow up as content creators. So I know I'm teaching to the converted for younger people. Um, uh, uh, Shannon, do you have another question? I see there's a bunch of them in there, but. Yeah, there's a ton. Um, how do you get an agent? Well, I'm glad I'm not gonna have to rant. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> uh, first you beg and plead, but no. Um, no, actually there's several ways to do it. Um, submit your work to contests, you know, get, get recognized in some way for your work. That'll attract attention to it. And it also gives you a calling card when you're trying to reach out smart, start with small boutique agencies that are looking for clients. Um, you're not going to be able to walk into CAA or paradigm or any place like that right away, but you're going to look for somebody in a small agency, uh, maybe a junior agent that's in a small agency. And then the other thing is, is, um, don't be afraid to talk about your work, just like Carl and everybody else said. Your credibility is going to be you. You're, you're, you, you. I try to tell my students, here's the fun thing about what you're doing. You're your own company. You, you got to believe in yourself and pitch yourself. You're the screenwriter. You're the CEO. You're the CFO. You're the janitor. You're the secretary. You're everything. So you have to sell yourself to whoever you want to represent you. Cause there's a lot of talented people out there. Why would they want to represent you? So number one thing is find ways to get your material seen. And if it's in contest or get some kind of recognition that that helps immensely. Um, somebody asked if there's boutique agencies in Pittsburgh and without, uh, first of all, there's a couple of things. One is it's a catch 22. 
your agent, and Gary will tell you this is a lawyer, you know, agents and lawyers either get paid up front, agents never get paid up front, they take 10%. So they are only going to hire you if you're working. So you say, well, how do I get an agent? You got to have sold something. Well, how do I sell something? You got to have an agent. So it's a problem. And it's not a problem for anybody who's at Pitt, because if you're a great writer, somebody who had a class from Jean Marie, who's now a teacher there, and we have great, great writers, we instantly know who are not only that, Sam Orlowski asked another question here about how do I make my script better? You know how I know that Sam Orlowski is a great writer? Because he's asking, how do I make it better? She already wrote a feature in my class, but the good ones are always making it better. The ones that are bad are always the ones, I've got the greatest script, I just need you to hand this to the sages. I'm gonna hand it, and then if they don't say anything, we're gonna send it to Asher, and if it says weak, if it says eh, that don't come back to me. But I know Ellen Roth is here, and how many versions have you done with Asher of your book so far? You gotta unmute Ellen if you wanna just briefly testify. I actually wanted the opportunity to speak. I have been in touch with Asher for many years, and I wanted to speak to the strengths of his company. Uh, I, had, I wrote a book, it's fantasy fiction. Uh, it has a 4.6 star rating on Amazon. <laughs> and uh, it's a long story, but I, I uh, Carl uh, encouraged me to send it to Asher, or maybe he just wanted to I discourage you. Yes, you can say that. Yeah. Me. Uh, but I'm irrepressible. So I, I did say to Asher and liked very much. So then my writing partner and I thought, well, we will write the screenplay. But we had never written a screenplay. We were untrained. So we have learned how to write a screenplay over many years. And one of the books that was very helpful was Asher's book. I read every book on how to write a screenplay, but this is wonderful because it's very readable. It's very understandable. So I would encourage everyone to read it. But not only has Asher's company provided uh, my writing partner and I with wonderful uh, coverage, the last interaction we had was we asked for development notes. And what came out of the development notes was to had we, would we consider making the protagonist a female instead of the male lead? And uh, it was in light of the Me Too movement, it was in light of people looking for strong female characters. So in order to do that, I brought a young writer from Hollywood on board to be a part of my writing team. And in the last year, we have reimagined the story. We actually just finished it. Asher doesn't even know this, uh, but we will be sending it back to you shortly to see what your Readers Unlimited thinks of it now that we have really completely rewritten the story from another perspective. And um, I'm excited to learn what you'll think of it, but I think, uh, I think we're getting there. Well, I think it's a great case study of persistence and people not looking to just do one draft and become millionaires and buy a big house. Um, <laughs> and I wanna just say to everybody, because uh, we only have time for a couple more questions. We could be here all night and I'm very grateful to the panelists and, and everybody for hanging around. But I wanted to say, one of the things that we're gonna do, and again, Asher did not come up. We're, we're asking Asher to do this and, and his company readers unlimited, but. We're gonna choose people you can submit through the Center for Creativity, but even if we don't choose you, you're free to go and submit to Asher's company, info at readersunlimited.com and, and get your own coverage and do this process. It's extremely hard to get an agent when you haven't, not just, they don't wanna just see one screenplay, they wanna see a commitment to the work because they wanna have a career and they wanna represent somebody for many years. So, um, Maybe um, since we're running out of time, if you have one more question, um, uh, Shannon, and then I'd like to get closing talk from all the panelists and then we can say goodnight. So, although again, Kevin just put his email and other people, he's at Pitt, I'm at Pitt, you can reach us. But, um, but uh, Shannon, do we have one last question and then we'll go to the panelists.
I can't hear you, Shannon. I see you're talking, but. How would you recommend uh, getting the money necessary to make a film of your own? <laughs> Gary did some independent financing in a while, but that I don't know. No small task, um, but uh, you know, it's uh, basically if you're looking to finance completely independently, it's it's a matter of you know basically reaching out to everyone and anyone with your project who might have access to capital. Um, I was a, I produced a, several small films with a fund that was raised through private equity, but it's a process, and it's you know it's a frankly it's exhausting. It's easier if you can get your material through the more established um channels uh but if you're determined to do it your own way and you know maintain creative control that is the one thing it gives you is you know you're really looking you, you, but you have to you know you can't just shop a script you really have to put together what's called a, a, a some form of a private placement memorandum which is really because you're raising you know you're raising equity it's the same as you know you have to comply with laws you're raising you know it's a you're raising you know uh capital in in the marketplace and you have to make sure you're complying with the applicable laws and so it's worth either getting someone else's uh, private placement memorandum and cribbing from it, or you know, hiring a lawyer to do it for you just to make sure you don't run afoul of you know securities law. Um, but people do it, and you know, it, it it does give you you know you're usually putting together a bunch of different uh, equity investors and uh, you know trying to do it for as efficiently and as modestly budgeted as possible because no independently produced film these days are made for, you know, 40, $50 million. It's usually the one, two, three, $5 million films. The good news is Pittsburgh and Pitt has resources that you can do at very, very low budget. But I don't know if Philip wants to comment or Dave, you know, I mean, doing it independently, I had to raise money for my Tale of Two Cities, which sadly and generously Philip became a contributor. But we had a mission. If you're going to do a movie like that, you're, you, don't tell people they're going to make money. It's got to be you have a reason to make it and they know we wanted to do a movie to help Pittsburgh with its comeback story. And ironically, Philip never got a nickel back from Tale of Two Cities. We had about 20 investors. But at the party for the movie is where Mark Lormer met him and ended up doing the book. So, um, you know, there's Kickstarters. There's, this generation has more things. I don't know, Dave, if you have anything to say about that. Um, I mean, the same type of things. I mean, there's Kickstarters. There's, you know, I did a documentary that was, you know, independently financed, but it was sort of like, self-financed it was super duper duper low budget and then at the end when we um we, once we had sort of the proof of concept we got people to come on board that you know had an interest in that particular topic um so that that'd be one thing like you know i guess in researching that you know i've read about this documentary about firefighters so then okay who's interested in firefighting they may be more apt uh i know a friend of mine has a lot of history stories so when they're tr he's trying to do history docs he tries to find who might be an interested party in that our documentary ironically was about the efficacy of voting um, which came out in 2016 and so as um, there was some money we didn't want to take because we wanted to be nonpartisan but we did get some some, some investors and things at the end in relatively speaking a little bit of money um, just to um, you know color correct and, and put towards animation and things like that but again that's that's a documentary the economics were uh, even now it would probably be higher but we're different than as Gary suggested where you know, these independent movies are, are more, a friend of mine's really into this world and, and it's very unreliable in one level. He's like, hey, I shoot in two weeks, but I don't really know if that's gonna happen. You know, so even up to two weeks going, he's like, I'm not sure if I'm going to Michigan or not, we'll find out. Um, but yeah, by hook or by crook, I guess is, is you know, how you do it. <clears throat> uh, all the stakes for systems, I, we, I wanna, uh, everyone's been generous with their time. If we could end with either final shots or I wanna start with Jean Marie, but I'd like to, um, if you don't mind, Dean Marie, because I've been fantasizing about you actually hearing this, because you aren't a Hollywood person, but you're one of the great writers, and you've also worked with so many great writers. Um, you don't have to start, but I was curious what you've learned from this conversation, and I'd like everyone to kind of close with a bit of advice that they might have for, um, you know, uh, people out there, especially any kind of writing you have to have persistence, but did you learn anything from this evening, not to put you on the spot, Jean Marie? And do you have any advice? And then we'll just put on the line for everybody. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my video off so I can talk. Um, oh my gosh, I learned a ton. And the first thing I learned was I wish that I had attended like panels like this back when I was, you know, trying to figure out this world because 
you see how, I mean, anyone who's listening, you see how crazy complicated it is and like all the people involved and like all these terms, you don't even know what half of them mean. And it's just like, it's so much to navigate. So don't try and navigate it yourself. You know, play just, if you're gonna focus your time, focus your time on your story. And that's what you're bringing to this. That's the thing everybody wants is the, the unique story that is that only you have. So focus your time on that and then attend panels like this and, and meet people and throw it at them. Like, you know, Dave, like I would, you know, Dave did it, I didn't do it. So just like get your story written and um, find some of these people you like and call them, email them. All of us are so helpful and happy to answer um, and, and toss it around with, with people like this. I'm not sure if I should go to Dave next or if he should just kind of say goodnight, whichever you want to say, or we can go to someone else, Dave. No, that was beautiful. The only thing I would say, which is, I just wanted to comment on something I think is important. And again, I don't know what percentage of your audience are, you know, uh, uh, going to write in sort of like long form, but, you know, you mentioned about the Fred Rogers story and I, I know Jean Marie was kind of the first person to include me into this. And I've been sort of watching, I'm sure Gary knows too, where nowadays a lot of the um, newspapers and magazines are, you know, I'm imagining they said, wait, why is are we making these stories out of things that are published in our article, our, 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 you know, publication, and all we get is sort of credit as based on this article, and we're not making money of it. So now what they've started doing, and I say now, I mean, the last couple of years is when you sell something to a magazine, a lot of times they want the rights. So you talked about retaining the rights earlier, Carl, and I think it's something important where, you know, just be careful, or at least be aware, and sometimes you know, if you don't ask that they don't have the rights, you can be, you know, you could be aware of that or don't necessarily, oh my God, somebody wants to publish my book. This is a small publisher, but I want to get it published. And they retain the film and TV rights and, and you know, maybe don't pay attention to this. But I, I, on the other side, as a producer, I've dealt with it a number of times trying to extract sort of rights and, and dealing with it. And I feel bad when, um, you know, when, for example, this guy that wrote this book kind of got sort of, I don't say he got screwed. I mean, in fairness, he got paid to write his book and it got published, but you know, he didn't realize that he didn't control it. So just to be cognizant about it, and if you are giving it up to get published, at least know what you're doing. By the way, I wasn't sure if you're talking about Philip, but I would like to know what you learned from this evening or any advice you have, Philip. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I didn't know all this stuff when I started, you know, because in some ways, if you know how complex and uh, and difficult the process is, um, you, you kind of have to have a naivete, I think, from the beginning in order to um, keep going. Um, uh, I wanted to give sort of, from a writer's perspective, I think Jean Marie already, already said it, you have to focus on your story and not on all this other stuff. Um, but just to sort of put that carrot out there, I will say, and I'm sure Jean Marie would agree with this, when you see something that you sat in a room by yourself doing 12 years ago result in hundreds of people and trucks and food service and talent coming together, it is, it, it is a dream come true. Um, it remain, remains to be seen whether the movie that was made from my book is any good. <laughs> that part of it was, was amazing and wonderful. Uh, by the way, starring Sadie Sink and other wonderful people, and we hope out next year. So, um, Gary, do you have any concluding thoughts? On actually, we'll go down the line for the rest of you. Sure. All I would say is, you know, I there, and I mentioned this before. There are so many more available platforms in which to create and exploit your work. Um, so, really, you know, and, and I've been doing this for twenty five years. And twenty five years ago, there were really far fewer outlets, and so there's a lot more opportunity out there. Um, I know it feels, you know, you're like, well, I'm in Pittsburgh. How do I do this? You know, but it's it's a digital world. And just, you know, if you are writing, sub, you know, write constantly, submit to all the places you can. Well, I think uh, Gary froze just in time. Are you there, Gary? Uh, Asher, he's frozen from what I can tell. So while we have you, why don't you go on? It, you know, there are, you know, depending upon your format. Well, there you know, is. Am I back or? You were froze for a second, but we're going to move to Asher, but thank you. And, and that's inspiring because there are more opportunities, but you do need to first write it. You don't put on magic shoes and then it gets made. 
to right. answer anything. Uh, yeah, I, I really think that the the uh, the inspiration and, and the lesson does come from Phil and the effort that he put forward, uh, the persistence he, he too, like Ellen, was, was irrepressible. He had his vision and he persisted for, for years. He uh, he got feedback and he was open to that feedback at times and he started <laughs> to spend other times, but, uh, you know, there was discourse and he was open to that discourse. and. Uh, he had a boldness to him. He, had, he was bold enough to put it out there and send it to me and then send it out to others. And, um, uh, you know, so there's intelligence, there's, there's timing there and, and everything just sort of went, went in his direction. And, and uh, you know, all the credit goes to Phil for that. Uh, by the way, I have a moment of apology here. Um, we had many an argument at the Aspinwall Grill and I encouraged him as we started fighting to write the screenplay himself. I think he would later say it wouldn't have been a bad idea and he did do a draft. You know, you can learn screenwriting, you can learn this industry, but the hardest part is that other stuff. So Kevin, speaking of which, we're blessed to have you at Pitt because there's a Pitt Studios. You now have really injected a whole sense of production and uh, with the film studies program, do you want to say anything finally to, to students and would-be students and people out there who aren't students? Yeah, yeah, real quick. Um, and F Philip, one of my best friends in the whole planet, she's like a daughter to me. She was the AD on your film uh, because of the book on the film, because of the book you wrote. And so when you say what a difference it makes in people's lives and the feeling you get, I, I you know, I've seen that front row and, uh, and have dear friends that benefited from all, you know, from people like you and, and the people on this panel. Uh, so it does make a difference in people's lives. Um, the, as far as what I learned, hey, the cool thing is everybody on this panel, we all have our different genres, um, but we're all storytellers. And I actually look at myself as a professional storyteller as opposed to a screenwriter, because you know, uh, like all of you, you're all remarkably talented. And it's the technique of telling a story in the, 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 the genre and the venue in which you like to tell it is what makes you unique and special. I'm just gonna give the students two axioms that, that I like to, to like let everybody know. And the first one is write about it or read about it. That's what I was told a long time ago. I, I, I love writing so much and all of you seem to, if you weren't here, if you, if you didn't love writing, you wouldn't be here on this right now. I, I love it so much that I, I, I can't imagine, I, I'm just shocked people still pay me to do it, to be honest with you, because I would do it for, well, I, I, yes, I would do it for free, but please, let's leave it to us. To, we'll keep it here. But that's how much you have to love it. And then the other axiom is when you get notes from professionals, just remember a, a pat in the back is only two inches away from a kick in the ass. <laughs> so understand that if a professional is giving you notes, that's a great thing because they're professionals. They know what they're talking about. So check the ego at the door and trust the notes you get from a professional. Those are my, my two little tips for you. Well, to kind of bring this to a close and a good segue here. Um, luckily, this, uh, this was possible through a grant through RK Mellon that they gave to the Center for Creativity. There's a new spoke called the Pittsburgh Lens whose mission it is to make Pittsburgh inspired stuff to the end. We are, have on the website now, if you go to uh, the Center for Creativity, you can see how to get involved and how to get your pitches there. Not all of them will get showcased, but we hope to have more panels like this and to have one in the spring particularly, where we'll showcase some panels. Just because you don't get chosen doesn't mean you didn't do something great. But I also wanted to thank, to me, I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm new to the Center for Creativity and there's amazing people there. I did want to thank Shannon Fink and Eric Shuckers and Chad Brown and, and Kit Ayers who really, it's a great, great place, Center for Creativity. And in COVID times, it's had to reinvent itself, and this is part of that. So we really hope that this is something that's ongoing. Uh, we promise there's more. You can instantly reach out and by going to the website and submit your projects. Uh, we won't be able to get back to all of them, but we are going to select some with the help of Asher and other people uh, to try to bring some diverse projects, again, to show you guys by example. And I can promise you, if you keep at it and you're great, you know, persistence is what you really heard. But the truth of the matter is Pittsburgh has great stories. Our expert isn't as much steel anymore as these amazing stories that go around the world. And each one of these tonight, I think you're gonna see 
Uh, if you haven't seen Concussion or Pride, please go rent that. And we look forward to seeing dear Zoe, but we're just really grateful for everyone to be here. And, and thank you guys so much. Really, really a great panel. Thank you all panelists. So. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Carl. Okay, thank you guys. Take care. Great Bye, to see everybody together. At once. Thank Bye. you. Nice meeting everyone. Thanks everyone. And nice meeting you guys. Thank you.